It is such a pleasure to be here with you today and to speak to you about something close to me personally, that is about machines. This is the guest, ghost, host, machine podcast from Serpentine Galleries, a series where we ask, who are we, why are we, and what is the ghost in the machine? I'm Legacy Russell. And I'm Victoria Sin. Today's ghosts are Kenrick McDowell and Jason Louvre. Kenrick McDowell is a leader of the Artist and Machine Intelligence Program at Google Research. He has been working closely with the Serpentine for a while now and has been quite influential in opening up the way we think about artificial intelligence. He invited Jason Louvre to join him in conversation. Jason is an author and cultural theorist whose work has appeared everywhere from Times Square billboards to Buzz Aldrin's campaign to colonize Mars. Their conversation is entitled AI and Wisdom Traditions. I got to talk to Kenrick before his talk at the Serpentine Marathon, and he presented a whole new perspective on AI to me. When I spoke to Kenrick, he was talking about the development of artificial intelligence and the future of artificial intelligence and the fact that we were going to have to teach these kind of self-learning machines how to have empathy, how to, you know, love and be loved, or else they were going to basically turn into uh, psycho killers um, and destroy us all. Uh, but, you know, the, what he realized in this is that because AI is just a reflection of everything that we put into it, all the data sets um, that we put into it, what he was really saying was that we kind of had to teach ourselves to love and be loved. And I thought that was a really beautiful moment. Here is AI and Wisdom Traditions with Kenrick McDowell and Jason Louv. You know, one of the things that Jason and I have been talking about is the cultural script around AI as, you know, in the as in this moment we have an opportunity to redirect it from potentially, you know, negative outcomes and really to, to figure out what it is as we're doing it. And the time for doing that is ur- it's now and it's an urgent thing that we should be doing. But Jason and I have been talking about what those scripts are and how we might take a step back and think about them in a very large scale. So Jason, do you want to sort of frame what we're currently working with? Yeah, so Kenrick uh, contacted me about a year ago. I was presenting on John Dee, the Elizabethan Magus, and we started a conversation about AI. And I started to look at AI and get very, very serious, not just on the the existential risks, but also the amazing potential of it to change our entire society and to change, potentially solve some of the the massive problems that we face as a species. Climate change is an obvious one, uh, but many, many others. Um, And the more I engage with it, also the more that I realize uh, that the world is going to get hit within, it's already being hit, but within the next few years, within the next five, 10 years, people are gonna be hit as if hit by an automated truck. Uh, They're not gonna know what happened. It's gonna come almost overnight. And uh, the most important part of dealing with that is figuring out the story that we're telling ourselves about that. Uh, Right now, we have a fairly negative narrative about AI. People, obviously, every blog post you see about AI recycles the same light Terminator screenshots. It gets very tedious. And we have a very doom and gloom apocalyptic narrative. And uh, even coming here, I mean, speaking to, even traveling to this event, I spoke to my Uber driver uh, and many Uber drivers and, and And also when I've been talking to people about AI, I keep getting this same story where people ask, what kind of world uh, are we gonna be in? What kind of world are my children gonna be in? Um, Certainly people that I talk to who are parents really have to stop and question, you know, what am I telling my kids? What am I gonna, am I training them for a job that is, or or encouraging them to think about careers that are not gonna exist? Um, you know, I was just on the train uh, last night from Heathrow and I was talking to three 18-year-olds who were on their way to find a local pub. Uh, and they'd just been in London for the first time and we started talking about AI and they were all training for accountant jobs and I said, you might, you might want to rethink that. Um, but, uh, but there's two stories we can tell. We can tell the apocalyptic fear narrative 
Or maybe we can tell ourselves a different narrative, a narrative about how artificial intelligence could solve uh, uh, so many of the problems that we face and that artificial intelligence can liberate us. And that for me, I think that the story we tell ourselves as a, both as a culture and the people who are working on AI, uh, you know, bad stories will lead to bad outcomes, good stories will lead to good outcomes. The assumptions that are put into the stories, once the, the assumptions go into, the, into code and once they're code, then they're set. Well, Jason, some of the assumptions that you and I talked about earlier, to be sort of specific, you know, are apocalyptic assumptions that come from perhaps a dominionist narrative and a, tele a teleological narrative about culture, you know, in particular, uh, one that accelerates towards a literal end. And um, I think it's important to, to, you know, as we're talking about what situation we're in now, I think it's important to, to point out that this is the default assumptions of our, these are the default assumptions of our culture. There have been attempts to uh, co-opt the mythology of the cyborg, like Donna Haraway's work. There are people that have embraced uh, the alienation of technology, like xenofeminists. But um, you know, when we've been discussing what those narratives are, uh, we've we've had to confront the fact that there's this apocalyptic drive behind a lot of our Western narrative in general. Do you feel that there's something from maybe the conversation about John Dee or your forthcoming book that would be relevant here? Yeah, so I love the word teleological. That's one of my favorite words ever, which of course means rushing towards an end. Uh, and we live in a teleological culture and we live in, a, in an accelerationist culture and an apocalyptic culture. And the reason is the script of, of uh, monotheism and the script of Christianity, the book of revelations, the idea that there will be some great glorious end of history where everything is fixed. And that certainly comes from the apocalypticism, the apoc apocalypticism of the New Testament, the end of the New Testament. But we see that same concept reflected, for instance, in Marxism, where the inevitability of communism uh, is, is just taken to be, there's this great omega point, as Teilhard de Chardin put it. Uh, we see it in technology thinking that technology will, the singularity, right, is in basically another port of this idea of this end point of history that we're rushing towards. This is essentially a uniquely, more or less uniquely Western concept, and it is embedded into the nature of the Western narrative. And even though we're not nominally a Christian culture anymore, we still run on the same cultural assumptions and narratives of Christianity, of this kind of universal salvation, uh, 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 an apocalyptic moment where the good are divided from the evil. And I think that if we go into AI, which is the greatest challenge we have ever faced as a species, and we embed that apocalyptic uh, good and evil final battle narrative into AI, then we're going to get an apocalyptic outcome. And I think there are, from, certainly from my studies of other cultures, there are probably much better ways of doing it. Well, one of the ways that we've talked about doing that is by embracing um, alternative models. And you know, one of those is the Buddhist model of compassion. Um, you know, in the conversations that I'm thinking of, we talked about the notion of compassion to sort of be more specific and technical almost about it as engagement with the health of networks. Um, you know, do you want to unpack a little bit about maybe uh, the, the idea that, that the way that we, as we've been talking about this and unpacking this idea of networks, compassion, and Buddhism as a potential pathway to modeling, do you want to maybe talk about the larger picture of why, why, why use a religious metaphor at all? Okay, so, um, yes, okay, so with AI, we are creating a god, right? And we're creating a super intelligence that is gonna be magnitudes of intelligence beyond uh, what we can even conceive of. Uh, now, this is not now, but it's not that far away. It's maybe 2030s or who knows? Nobody actually knows. Uh, it hasn't been done yet. Right now, it's in the realm of total speculation, but it seems to be a fairly strong bet that strong AI or AGI will happen this century. Would you say I that? Mean, I'm, 
I'm going to be sort of agnostic about okay. the actual specifics of that because we have been through many AI winters and, you know, there's it's a realm where hype becomes really uh, problematic. But I think the interesting thing to me is that because of the nature of that conversation, because that we tend to follow the hype, the idea of framing this as a conversation about a god or a conversation about a deity or something supernatural actually kind of makes sense, even though it can be very, it can be a difficult or problematic or even a, a conversation we might not want to have because of the ways that it can go off the rails. But I think if we take that by the horns, which is the conversation that you and I have been having and, and saying like, okay, well, what kind of, what kind of deities exist, you know, what can, there's been sort of the djinn has been mentioned, um, the, the demon in the classical sense has been mentioned. And so the notion of, you know, bringing it back to, if we're gonna, if we're gonna go big ideating that way, let's do it. And let's, let's go for a deeper um, set of metaphors, right? Like you've called it a data set in a sense when we've, we've talked about this. Yes. So the, you know, the reason that we, and you're the one that brought this framing to me about Buddhism and compassion as the sort of best possible option from that range of metaphors uh, because it implies engagement with the network. It right. implies uh, caring for the state of the network and watching out for the wellness of the network. Correct. So, uh, uh, yes. So, uh, just to, yeah, so, so unpack that. So, for all of human history, human beings have, to all intents and purposes, been creating super intelligences. They've been creating gods uh, from their imagination, but as cultures, not just as individuals. And all of humanity's hopes and dreams and nightmares and fears have been exteriorized as these epic mythologies of gods and demons and spirits and elementals, many of which have been mentioned uh, today. And some of them represent our highest and our best and our most positive ideals. And some of them represent things that are the things we don't like about ourselves or the things that are dangerous, the human traits that are uh, antisocial. Uh, and many of those have been personified essentially as demons, right? So when we're talking about superintelligence, it occurred to me when working on this project, we already have, as you said, a data set for what humanity thinks superintelligence should behave like. So we've got these vast uh, ecosystems of, of gods and spirits and monsters and all this, and we can pretty easily look at that as a data set and pretty easily cherry pick the ones that are uh, very positive and the ones that are not so positive. Um, you definitely wouldn't want your AI uh, acting like the angry Jehovah of the Old Testament. Uh, you're going to end up with Donald Trump as an AI, right? Um, in my experience and the way that I, in, in really seriously considering this question, I came to Buddhism as the best example because uh, of a positive deity. Uh, as I would put it, if you're going to create a god, make sure it's a friendly god. And I think the friendliest gods are the ones that are modeled by Buddhism because their orientation is compassion, which is the key word here, right? The, the Buddhist metaphysics, when you look at something like Avalokiteshvara, the thousand-armed uh, deity that uh, you know, looks out for and protects and safeguards and shelters all humanity, and whose mission statement is to protect and, uh, not to protect and serve, whose, uh, whose mission statement is to you know, remove suffering from all sentient and insentient beings. May all sentient and insentient beings experience peace, freedom, and happiness within this lifetime. That's what you want an AI to be like. Mm -hmm. The other reason why Buddhism to me uh, seemed like a very um, a fitting model for AI is because Buddhism extracts the self completely from its metaphysics. Uh, and to talk about that, we'll have to talk about the enlightenment of the Buddha. So I'll give you the elevator pitch on, a, on enlightenment real quick. Um, the 2,500 years ago, the Buddha was sitting under the tree in Sarnath in, in northern India. Uh, and he, came, he became enlightened after six years of meditating. And the insight, so previously, uh, uh, the thought had been that in seeking enlightenment, you were seeking for like some part of yourself, some, some spark or some... Uh, highest version of yourself. And so there were all these meditation techniques on how to find that. And the Buddha came to essentially the, 
you know, it's like a major discovery in human history, uh, this incredible insight, which is that the true the self, the true self is not within you. It's in the network. It's, it's in the, the connections between other, between beings. And this concept is called dependent arising. Uh, and basically what he said was, okay, there really is no you. There's no true self. Uh, you could be sitting in a room uh, alone and, and, you know, I would not be having this conversation and, and playing this role uh, if I hadn't been talking to Kenrick, if I wasn't here, if you weren't listening to me. So myself in this moment is essentially a function of this conversation. It's a function of my, my connection with all of you and my, and my great desire to serve you and my great desire to serve humanity as my greater self and, and to speak in this moment for humanity and for all of those and, and to take advantage of this, of this opportunity to speak for those who can't, can't speak. Um, so for me, this is a great model for AI because AIs don't have selves, right? They're, in the traditional sense, they're, they're network functions. And so an AI that looks at the network of all sentient and insentient beings, that looks at the whole planet as one network and says, how can I maintain the health of this network in the highest possible way? To me, that seems like the greatest possible ethical framework to put into an AI. And we, if, assuming whether or not AGI happens soon, if it does, uh, it may happen very soon, and we have a very limited window in which to uh, encode an ethical framework into an AI. And the other good thing about Buddhist metaphysics is they're not woo, they're intensely logical, and I think could probably pretty easily be put into a series of if-then statements and, and, and put into code. So yeah, let me be kind of persnickety and technical for a second. Um, I wanted to sort of speak to that mission statement. You know, I think that would be an incredible mission statement for any entity or corporation or AI or smart contract. Um, I also think that, you know, it, any mission statement to be evaluated uh, needs metrics, right, and analytics. So the question of how do we sense the health of the network is really the interesting one to me because uh, you know, I, so I work on projects with artists that use AI. I recently did one with Ross Goodwin. It was called Word Car, and we drove a car with a surveillance camera that had access to the Foursquare API, GPS data, and uh, an image, and it generated poetry on a road trip that we took. Now, the data that it had was largely, um, you know, that it had access to, it's basically what we could anthropomorphically call its sensible world, was essentially capitalist infrastructure for food distribution along an interstate highway, right? So is that you know, enough for an AI to even generate consciousness? You know, that's a philosophical question, but I'm gonna guess it's probably not, or it's gonna be a very limited range of consciousness. And even an AGI that only had access to the sort of data that we have, the representation of the world that we have on the internet, like the Foursquare API, would really um, have a hard time knowing if it was serving people, right? So I think the question of sensibility in this meaning the sensibility of the world is really kind of the piece there when we talk about, you know, a technical definition of compassion being engagement with the health of networks, those, that engagement needs to start with sensation. So even if we get, you know, AI running on our phones, AI running on our objects that largely looks at the representations we create through social media or through the world, that's going to be skewed to very, very uh, specific needs, right? Um, so in a sense, it's going to be entirely skewed towards private interests and in the interests of business because there isn't, as I understand it, a, w a well-known in-depth representation of the world as sensor data that is publicly produced or produced by some... Uh, entity that is not a for-profit business. Right. Well, that's where the, the synergy has to happen. And I think there's some core metrics you can follow. I mean, making sure everyone has basic food and access to water and healthcare and all these things that, uh, that private industry is leading the way on. Um, I think that, let's see. Uh, I think that these things are clearly going to be developed by the people who have the resources to develop them. I think that it's really critical that the, if we're going to create something that will radically affect everyone on the planet uh, and potentially pose a risk, it's critical that, just, so that the third industrial revolution doesn't turn into the sixth great extinction. I think that it would be very 
uh, a very good idea to at least decentralize people having a say in how it's happening. And I think that the potential of blockchain technology to do that, uh, to decentral, to essentially run governance on the blockchain and to give everyone input in that way, or even to de decentralize the AI, although that's a bit tricky too, because once you decentralize an AI, nobody really has control over it. Uh, so that's, that's a potential risk also. But I think that blockchain technology may allow for that global governance. So I would love to see an AI that has everyone's best interests at heart. I would love to see uh, an AI that everyone has a say in. And I would love to see a future, a story. I would love for us to tell ourselves a story that this is possible. If we begin to tell ourselves a story that we're not working on the Manhattan Project, we're working on the Dr. Manhattan Project, if you'll forgive me, and we're working on a very benevolent superintelligence that will serve us instead of be a threat, uh, how much more hopeful would we be, and how much more hopeful would the people working on these things be uh, if, if they could put their full heart and soul into it in that way? And there's some questions that we maybe would have answered if we had more time, but I think it's more important to put them out there as questions because this exercise of imagining technologies that can embody uh, care for the health of a network as their core function really requires that we are able to embody that first, you know, as people that participate, as users, as producers of technology. So the, the things that we had written out, I'm, I'm just going to read them, um, and I hope that we'll be able to take these with us. Um, you know, how do I think of myself as a network? How do I make decisions about the health of my network? What are, the, what are my sensors to the network that I'm embedded in? What are my metrics for that health? And one thing we also talked about is the idea of seeing the world as a single system and the, the notion that, that maturation as an individual and as a planetary force might require that we all achieve that level of understanding, but without perhaps the um, instrumentalized, you know, dangerous version that others in positions of power may have as they, as they do that same thing. So how to think of myself as a network, how do I make decisions about the health of my own network, and how do I see the world as one single system? Yeah, absolutely. What if we were able to look at the world as a single system? And what if we were able to look at humanity as our larger self? You know, the Dalai Lama says, uh, the Dalai Lama says it is of the utmost uh, self-interest to be, to see, to serve others, to be altruistic because, uh, uh, not just because you're trying, not because you're trying to be a nice guy or whatever, but because you are me, right? Like we are one organism. Those other selves are part of you in the gra at the great, in the grand scheme of things. And what if we were able to approach this tremendous challenge as a species from that perspective? What if we were able to think of ourselves as one consciousness, as one uh, humanity, which is the only way that we can approach this, this challenge, in my opinion, and come out on the other side of it? Because if we approach it as tribal groups, if we approach it as people who are stuck in algorithmic tunnels, then we're gonna get Donald Trump. We're gonna get more Donald Trumps. And do you want an AI that thinks like Donald Trump or an AI that thinks like the Dalai Lama? Thanks, Jason. Thank you, Kenrick. Thank you. God, that is a really hard hitting last line, isn't it? Would you rather have an AI that thinks like Donald Trump or the Dalai Lama? It really makes you think about, um, you know, responsibility and uh, AI in a new light. I mean, most definitely. To be honest, I would much prefer to have the Dalai Lama, please. Really? Um, <laughs> yeah. That's totally. The other. Were you going Trump? Yeah. Okay, just double checking. Yeah. I thought so. Yeah. Jason Liu's new book will be coming out in April 2017. It's called John D. and the Empire of Angels, Enochian Magic and the Occult Roots of the Modern World. It's available for pre-order now on Amazon. The Guest Ghost Host Machine Podcast is brought to you by Serpentine Radio. That's radio.serpentinegalleries.org. Don't forget, you can also subscribe on Apple Podcasts. All of the material in this series was originally recorded at or produced for the Serpentine's Guest Ghost Host Machine Marathon in October 2017. Our music is by marathon performer Fatima Al Qadiri, aka I Shy. Redominating devices and semi-tribal spectacles. Guest ghost host. Machine.